Good morning, everyone. I am Gandhi Daniels, the Executive Director of the Wellness Coalition. I would like to welcome you to the Wellness Coalition's second breastfeeding webinar. For those of you who are not familiar with the Wellness Coalition, the agency has been in existence for 21 years, serving the, the citizens of the River Region counties in Alabama. We are a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to facilitate a coordinated community-wide system to improve the health and wellness of people with limited to no health insurance through a collaboration and services in education. Some of the services we offer are case management, insurance and enrollment, and community wellness programs, such as chronic disease self-management, diabetes self-management, and the diabetes prevention program. The Wellness Coalition also makes referrals to other community partners to meet the needs in the community. Today, we are here to inform you about overcoming barriers to breastfeeding through a Centers for Disease Control grant called REACH. This is our second webinar in a series of four. I hope you can gain the needed information that will help you with overcoming barriers to breastfeeding so that there are more childbearing age women who will begin to breastfeed their babies. The webinar will last for two hours, and I hope you will join us and tell a friend to join us for the remaining two webinars. Social workers and nurses can obtain continuing education credits and contact hours for the webinar. Social workers can gain two education credits and nurses can gain 2.4 contact hours. To be eligible, you must register for the webinar, attend the entire webinar, and pay the cost of $8 for the credits. And we are requesting that everyone complete the short evaluation form that will be emailed to you following the webinar. The evaluation form will come to you from the wellness conference email address. We hope you will take a few moments to complete the evaluation and provide feedback to the speakers and the agency about your experience today. Thank you for joining us, and I hope, the, I hope you enjoy the webinar. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Latrice Lewis, our REACH program coordinator, to tell you about REACH. Good morning. Again, thank you so much for attending our webinar. I'm going to give you a little background about REACH. REACH stands for Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health. It is a five-year cooperative agreement with CDC, which we were awarded in 2018, and we're planning to move through 2023. Our priority population is low-income, low-educated African Americans, located within 42 census tracts in Lounge, Macon, and Montgomery County. Our goal with the grant is to increase access to health care as well as healthy food through various strategies. Um, in including healthy corner stores, health ministry, and working with church partners, um, tobacco, breastfeeding education, and clinical and community linkages of our community health program, which Gundy mentioned, our CDSMP diabetes prevention, as well as diabetes self-management program. Breastfeeding goal for us is just to increase the number of people that will consider breastfeeding their newborn child up until the age of 12 months. Um, as well as to encourage our community the benefits of breastfeeding. Again, thank you for joining us on our webinar. We hope that you gain all that you have come to gain in addition to all that we hope we need to do to again, encourage breastfeeding within our community. I'm gonna now turn it over to one of our breastfeeding consultants, Ms. Adila Smith, thank you. Good morning, everybody. As she said, I'm one of two breastfeeding consultants with the Wellness Coalition. Uh, my name is Adila Smith. I just want to go over a few things today. I just want to go over the housekeeping. Um, make sure your mics and cameras are turned off for the duration of the webinar, but we do encourage discussion in the chat box. Um, when you're chatting, make sure so everybody sees it, select panelists and attendees in that drop down box. Make sure if you have any specific questions that you'd like answered during the webinar when the Q&A portion comes, that you use the Q&A box to submit those questions and we'll make sure they get answered live. And please, please, please complete the survey that'll come to your email once the webinar ends. Uh, your feedback helps us to plan future webinars and other things. Um, so there's the housekeeping. I want to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. I'm so excited. We have three speakers 
coming from the gift of life today we have jenny bass christy gay and jesse yates uh jenny bass a little bit about her she's a certified lactation counselor she's also a nurse she works through the nurse family partnership or the nurse family visitor program um, with the gift of life and she's definitely committed to increasing community breastfeeding knowledge um, we also have Christy Gay. She is the nurse supervisor for the Nurse Family Partnership. Christy um, is really big on advocating for the health and wellness of moms and babies. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, she's one of the super. She's the supervisor, obviously, and she also serves on the ADPH committee or the Alabama Department of Public Health Committee for infant mortality. And Last but not least, Mr. Jesse Yates. He's an educator by trade. His top mission is to equip fathers with the knowledge and the tools to become active and involved fathers. Uh, and he is the fatherhood family coach and he also leads uh, the fatherhood, or excuse me, the Fathers in Action initiative over there at Gift of Life. So without further ado, we're gonna jump right into our webinar, Barriers of Breastfeeding, and we'll hear about some benefits too. Good morning. Glad to be with y'all this morning. We're really excited. Uh, and thank you to the Wellness Coalition for having us. Um, do want to encourage you to use your chat box um, and include your questions and answers in that um, section. Um, we will try to answer a few questions as we go along, but what we don't get to, then we'll try to cover those at the end. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, barriers that you may have faced. If you will, put those in the chat box. Um, are there some barriers that you have faced or that uh, people that you work with have faced? Um, we'd like to know about that. Um, there are um, a lot of barriers that moms face. Sometimes it prevents them from breastfeeding at all. Sometimes uh, it shortens that breastfeeding journey. So we want to talk about those and maybe help with that. Um, there's several that we want to cover today. Lack of knowledge, um, social norms, poor family and uh, social support, embarrassment, lactation um, problems. Um, sometimes employment and childcare can be an issue and then also barriers related to health services. Uh, one of the uh, things that popped up on um, the chat box already is pediatricians. Sometimes our healthcare providers are not um, as well versed as you might think, or uh, they may not be as pro um, breastfeeding as you might think that they would be. So sometimes that does prevent a bit, present a barrier. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and how you can be an advocate for your child um, in those situations. Um, let's start off with the lack of knowledge. Um, I think a lot of times um, moms have heard about breastfeeding, they've heard about the benefits of it, but they may not um, fully understand um, how to go about breastfeeding, um, what they need to know in order to start that journey. Um, I think there are a lot of women who are interested in breastfeeding but aren't fully aware of the benefits or how to go about it. There are a lot of uh, support areas available uh, that you may not be aware of. Um, you know, there are classes in town, there are um, support people in the hospital um, that you may not be fully aware of. Um, a lot of times uh, talking about breastfeeding may be broached briefly in an OB visit, but may not be um, fully supported with a lot of information. So, um, you know, we want to empower you to ask the questions that you need to, to gain the knowledge um, that you need. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, there is um, a lot of information out there as far as uh, what's normal. Uh, the social norms we've 
kind of um, over the last 30, 40 years, um, when formula was introduced, it was looked at as um, that was the normal way to feed your infant. It was also um, initially people thought that if you were affluent or if you were well off, that that was the way to do things. So when it became widespread um, and became available, then of course people thought that was the preferred method. Um, but honestly, we didn't even know the benefits at that point in time of breastfeeding. There's been so much research done um, to inform us of, of what uh, our babies were missing out on uh, in formula. Uh, this social norm has presented a problem. And so that's one of the things that we have um, a mission to do is to change that social norm. We want the social norm to be breastfeeding. So um, another one of the um, barriers that we'll talk about is uh, the lack of social support uh, and family support. Many times um, mothers may not know anyone in their uh, circle of friends and family that have successfully breastfed. And this is one of the things that um, helps a mom to become successful is um, having that support. So I would encourage you to find someone um, in your circle of friends or family who has been successful or who has maybe not been that successful but wishes she had, who can come alongside you and encourage you. Um, I think that's very, very important. Um, the negative attitudes of friends and family can really pose a serious barrier. Um, I've had a mom myself who, as a teenager, felt like it was really important for her to um, breastfeed her baby. Um, but her mother didn't see the importance of that. She had had 10 children, didn't breastfeed any of them, and did not see the importance of her daughter doing that. Needless to say, um, breastfeeding was not successful with her in that first pregnancy. But with a subsequent pregnancy, when she was not living under that mother's roof, she was able to successfully breastfeed. So that family and friend support can make or break your breastfeeding journey. Um, let's talk a little bit about embarrassment. Uh, if we could move on to that slide. Many times, a lot of women, because they've not been exposed to breastfeeding, um, they're very concerned about not breastfeeding in public. Um, and that's really not something you have to even worry about. You don't have to breastfeed in public if that's um, something that you're not comfortable with. Um, a lot of times women feel socially excluded. Maybe their friends and family don't include them in um, events. Um, kind of let people know ahead of time, hey, I'm gonna be breastfeeding, but I'm still very interested in participating in um, activities. Uh, we can work around that. Uh, sometimes it's difficult, or you may perceive it as being difficult, to be able to breastfeed in places like restaurants or places of business. Um, I think that you'll find that there are a lot more breastfeeding uh, friendly places than you might think. Um, we are actually, without a breastfeeding committee, working toward finding um, places that are actually breastfeeding friendly and recognizing them for that, um, that they provide a comfortable, clean place for you to nurse your baby or to pump. So just be aware of that. Um, you may even see going into a place of business that they have a little sticker on their window that says they're breastfeeding friendly. So um, one example is uh, the breastfeeding tents that they have at the University of Alabama, as well as Auburn University um, for breastfeeding moms. That's just been something within the last three or four years that have come to be and um, provide a lot of extra support. All right, let's talk a little bit about lactation problems. Um, what kind of problems have you faced um, 
we find that a lot of times moms will have uh, problems with their nipples being sore. They may have engorged breasts. Um, they may have an infection in their, bra in their breast called mastitis. Um, they may have a problem with leaking milk or pain or um, failure to latch on um, by the infant. Um, a lot of different problems present themselves. And I think that um, it's really important to know there's support out there for you. There are places that you can go to um, help you resolve those issues. Um, if you uh, delivered at one of our hospitals in town, then um, we have lactation consultants at each hospital who are more than willing to work with you, talk to you, work through those problems. Unfortunately, right now with our COVID situation, they're not able to um, see breastfeeding moms on an outpatient basis, but they can um, certainly um, talk you through a lot of problems. Um, I had a call this week from a mom who was um, having some issues with breastfeeding and it turned out she started telling me about her nipples after she nursed. Um, they were flat, they were blanched, she was very uncomfortable with her breastfeeding and it turned out that her baby had a, had a tongue tie and that was what was causing uh, some of those issues. In those situations you again go to your breastfeeding consultant, talk to them about the symptoms you're having and then also uh, discuss that with your uh, pediatrician, or you can uh, contact uh, a pediatric dentist and have them um, assess that baby for a tongue tie. I know that we have um, one pediatric dentist in Montgomery and another one in Alabaster. Um, also a, 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 a ENT in Birmingham who are doing laser revisions of um, tongue and lip ties, and they can really, um, pose a problem, they can prevent your baby from gaining weight, they can cause your um, breast, your breastfeeding experience to be very uncomfortable and actually cause damage to your nipples. So those are very important things to, um, to assess. Um, a lot of moms worry about milk supply. Um, is your baby having enough wet diapers? is um, your baby satisfied at the end of a feeding. Um, those are things that, um, that you need to be concerned about. But certainly, again, if you're concerned that your baby is not getting enough milk, then make sure that you are um, reaching out to your resources. Um, so those are just really, really important. Um, also, a lot of moms, um, are concerned about going back to work. That's a big concern, a big barrier. Um, there are laws in place, federal laws, that mandate that hourly employees have to be provided with a acceptable place to, to breastfeed or to pump, and also that um, you're provided with that time to pump. Um, it does not say that they have to pay you for that time, but they do have to provide you with it. Um, as far as how often it would be, however often you nurse, um, I would say that you could probably pump two to three times during the day um, to be able to provide your baby with enough milk for the next day. So um, those are things that are Better off if you can address those with an employer before you deliver. Let them know that you're going to need a place so that they can be working on that. Maybe even um, say, hey, you know, I noticed that there's a um, office back here that we're not using. Could we, you know, set that up for me to pump? Um, stick you a note on the door that says pumping in session and go for it. Um, it's a little bit more difficult in fast food restaurants. I've had several clients who had difficulty, but they were able to um, go into the manager's office and close the door for them to pump. Um, again, there are ways to get around that. There are ways to work it out if you are determined in your breastfeeding journey that this is what you want to do um, and you understand the benefits for your baby. 
you'll do what you have to, to, to make that happen. And you'll be an advocate for your baby and work with your employer and know what your rights are. Um, I did put on the slide at the very end with resources. There is um, a website that you can go to and actually read what the law states and how to go about um, getting help with that. Um, and certainly if you have any difficulties with that, reach out to us and um, I'll be glad to see if I can um, find the resources for you to follow up on that. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Um, sometimes we find that the actual, one of the biggest barriers that we have is actually in health services. Um, there may not be a big priority for supporting your breastfeeding journey. Um, your pediatrician may not be as supportive. Your OB may not be as supportive or even within the hospital setting. You may have a nurse that's not a big uh, proponent of um, breastfeeding. But as your baby's advocate, I encourage you to reach out and ask for someone else. Um, is there somebody else in your practice or somebody else uh, on staff today that is um, more comfortable with uh, breastfeeding and um, understands my desire to breastfeed? Um, a lot of times it's just insufficient knowledge on the um, part of the healthcare provider. Um, but there are resources available for you in other areas. Um, like I said before, the lactation consultants at the hospital, certainly at Gift of Life, we'll be glad to do what we can. If you're, even if you're not a participant in one of our programs, I'll be glad to talk to you. Um, and of course, the Wellness Coalition um, has their folks on board too. Um, that are willing to reach out and help you in any way we can. So um, please utilize the um, avenues that you do have available to you. Um, we would just really encourage you to do that. And let your service providers know um, ahead of time, hey, this is something I really feel very strongly about. Um, I know I have a niece that lives in Louisiana who, um, for whatever reason, her baby was not gaining weight and her be her doctor wanted her to supplement her uh, feedings with formula. And she was very adamant. She really didn't want to do that. Um, so they compromised. She supplemented with breast milk instead of with formula. And so um, was able to um, get around using that formula. Some pe For some people, they're just dead set against it. And there are ways to work it around it. If you can um, avoid using formula, um, it's really better for your baby um, to use solely breast milk, but um, there are some situations where we do have to supplement with formula. So just work with your health care providers and um, I think once they see your heart's desire, they will be willing to work with you. Um, we'd like to show you a little video right now. Um, this is just a little uh, short video, a, a breastfeeding story um, about one of our moms. Um, and I think you'll enjoy hearing her perspectives. I'm Jenny Bass, nurse home visitor with Gift of Life's Nurse Family Partnership and a certified lactation counselor. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that babies be breastfed exclusively for the first six months of life. Breastfeeding has tremendous benefits, not just for baby, but for you too. Breast milk is the perfect food. It contains antibodies that helps your baby fight off viruses and bacteria. Breastfeeding lowers your baby's risk of having asthma or allergies. Plus, babies who are breastfed exclusively for the first six months without any formula have fewer ear infections, respiratory illnesses, and bouts of diarrhea. Breastfeeding also lowers your baby's risk of sudden infant death syndrome. 
Women who breastfeed can lower their risk of developing conditions like type 2 diabetes, premenopausal breast cancer, and ovarian cancer, and it burns up to 500 extra calories a day, helping you return to a healthy weight. Though making the decision to breastfeed is a personal decision, you owe it to yourself and to your baby to be fully informed. Here, Gift of Life mom, Elena, explains why she decided to breastfeed. Uh, one of the reasons why I breastfed and my husband was very supportive of it because I have always had a very bad immune system. To this day, I get sick really easily and I was never breastfed. So I always kind of, it's in the back of my head, like what if I was breastfed, would I be better off? And so that was one reason for the health benefits because it's so, so nutritious and so helpful for your babies. But then secondly, economically, it's free. Like, I mean, our bodies make it, it's completely free and formula costs about two thousand dollars a year so that's a given so we had a couple different reasons I did not know much about breastfeeding when we made the decision to do it uh, but I had a good friend of ours uh, give us a book it's called the womanly art of breastfeeding and I read it cover to cover really really good book and it's very short and just taught us so much so by the time that the children were born uh, we knew a lot <laughs> um, I did have a good bit of support when it came to issues with latching and other things other challenges with breastfeeding my husband was very supportive and there's a nurse here at the nurse family partnership her name is Jenny and she came over once or twice and even talked to me on the phone when I had just the random questions like is he eating enough am I doing this right or you know just anything she was very helpful and that was a great service I did have several challenges with both children uh, with Julian um, after he was about three months old I developed mastitis and that is a clogged, a clogged uh, breast duct and so I had a horrible fever uh, was very ill for about a week before that infection finally went away but I persisted with breastfeeding and that one resolved itself um, then with our second child with Isabella she had colic and a lot of acid reflux so she would actually like vomit non-stop and there was nothing to fix that and so um, I ended up not really breastfeeding her but actually pumping exclusively and that is so tiresome it was so much more work and all, you know just everything else to go with it but she's 17 months now and we're still nursing at night so um, we've made it through the, the dark times <laughs> we're good now <laughs> I think some women choose not to breastfeed just if they don't have enough support maybe their boyfriend or their spouse is not keen on it I'm not exactly sure or just lack of education um, that might be another big reason if they don't know all the benefits and um, I don't even know if, if you know going back to work some women have to go back to work really fast and they are worried about pumping and it is tiresome it is a job and it is a big commitment so and there might be some health problems you never know I, I, there could be a number of reasons um, my husband's support has been amazing uh, the fact that he uh, encouraged it was very helpful he's he's a registered nurse as well so that his knowledge of you know health benefits was definitely something that made us both jump on board with breastfeeding um, now physically obviously he doesn't do much for that but um, he helps out when I'm tired because you're up all night nursing and stuff and so so he lets me sleep in a little bit if, if he's off work that day so he's just been great in all different ways for a pregnant woman who is wondering if breastfeeding is right for her and her future child I would say just read educate yourself um, talk to other mothers and no choice is wrong as long as your baby's fed no choice is wrong but just look at your budget your financial situation maybe it's an economical choice think about your own life and your own health and and do you want to offer your child an, an, adv an advantage um, to you know having that extra immune boost or IQ boost there's so many different reasons so I would just say educate yourself talk to people ask questions and and then just choose for yourself and it's not wrong whatever you choose is not wrong thanks Elena if you want to learn more about the benefits of breastfeeding Visit Gift of Life online at www.golfound.org or call 334-272-1820.
was helpful. Um, I think it's always good to hear a mom's perspective. Um, it is really encouraging as a um, lactation counselor to hear that um, the support that we've been able to provide has helped. Um, I think there's a lot more support out there than um, is taken advantage of. Um, again, I just encourage you to reach out to your IBCLCs, to us, to the Wellness Coalition, and um, as well as there's a mommy group here in town on Facebook called Nursing Mommies of Montgomery. Um, it's a lot of support to moms. You'll find that um, you may not have good support from grandparents or from family, or there may even be friends who second guess your choices. And it helps to have that community of, of folks who have the same desire and um, who can come alongside of you and say, you know, you're doing the right thing for your baby, who can encourage you. And so I would encourage you to, to join that group and maybe, you know, it may not be for you, but at least take a look at it and um, see if there's some, some extra support there um, that you can find. Um, let's talk a little bit about the benefits of breastfeeding. I think that so often we, um, we know that breastfeeding is, a, is the best for your baby, but we're not always uh, well-versed on what those benefits are as far as um, specifics. And I think that I found that in my own breastfeeding journey, even though that was 30 years ago. Um, you know, I knew that breastfeeding was what I wanted to do. I knew it was best for my baby, but there are things that I've learned, of course, things that they've researchers have just learned in the last 10 or 15 years, things that I didn't know. Um, just the fact that when you're nursing, that you're giving your baby living cells. Um, that to me was one of the most impressive things that I ever heard. I, I just, the healing properties of breast milk are so amazing to me. Um, but let's just run through some of these um, benefits real quick and then we'll kind of um, give you a chance to um, talk about that a little bit. Um, of course, breast milk is the best food for your baby. Um, it's the way we were created. Um, breast milk is, is, you know, all anybody had until the late 50s, early 60s when formula came about. Um, and we had healthy babies and we still do. So, um, Breast milk really helps as far as brain development. Um, there are studies that have shown that um, babies who have bre bre been breastfed um, have higher IQs, um, that it really helps with the development of those little neurons in the baby's brain. Um, it's convenient, it's portable. You can, um, you know, breastfeed anywhere you are. Um, there's no bottles to wash, no nipples to sterilize. Um, wherever you are, you can nurse. Um, it doesn't matter how large your breasts are or how small they are. Um, your body is still equipped to give your baby what your baby needs. Um, and it's infant specific. I think that's one of the most amazing things about it. And again, one of those things that as a breastfeeding mother, I didn't know. Um, your baby, your breast milk is specific for your baby. Um, my breast milk would be totally different from your breast milk. So I just think that's just so amazing um, that our bodies were created that way. It just blows my mind. Um, it's beneficial not only for baby, but it's also beneficial for mothers. Um, moms who breastfed have reduced risk of, and I have to pull out my list because there's so many great things. Um, high cholesterol, you've got a reduced risk of high blood pressure, coronary artery and heart, and, um, heart disease, 
type 2 diabetes, premenopausal breast and ovarian cancer, hip fractures and osteoporosis after menopause, rheumatoid arthritis and early menopause. That's impressive. That's an impressive list. Um, so I think it's great to know that it's good for baby, but it's also good for you as a mom. Um, it also helps with bonding. Um, there is a very special bond between a breastfed baby and a mom. Um, it's just different. It, it's, uh, and it's really sad when it goes away. So don't be surprised if you have a little bit of mild depression when you wean your baby, because that, that bonding, that, um, that special bond you have with your baby when you're nursing is very different. Um, it does have ongoing benefits. Um, it's, it's just, it provides your baby with so many antibodies and um, there's so many things that it helps prevent. Again, this list is so expansive. I'm gonna go over this, but your baby's at an increased risk for these things if your baby is formal fed. So think about this. Higher risk of illnesses like ear infections, respiratory infections and asthma. Higher risk of allergic reactions like eczema. Higher risk of di diarrhea higher risk of obesity, higher risk of childhood leukemia and lymphoma, and a higher risk of chronic diseases, such as diabetes, celiac disease, and inflammatory bowel disease. So these are things that babies who are formula fed have a higher risk for. So I think it's very important to share those things with your family who don't realize why um, breastfeeding is so important to you, the people who are giving you a hard time about it, share that information with them. Let them know what those benefits are and why it's so important. Um, it's great for working mothers. Um, it gives you that extra special time with your baby before and after you go to work. Um, and it's not... People that are returning to work think that it's going to be so difficult. And it does take extra time, but it's so worth it. If you've got to be away from your baby, at least know that even though you're away, uh, you're still providing your baby with the best possible nutrition that he or she could receive. Um, breast milk can be frozen. Um, it can be refrigerated. It can last for months in a deep freeze. So um, it, it's just, it's such an amazing substance. It, it's, it blows my mind, can you tell? Uh, <laughs> it's great for the environment. Um, think about all the trash that goes um, into our landfills that are associated with formula. There's the cans, there's the bottles, there's the um, bags, there's all kinds of stuff that goes into our landfills that is totally eliminated uh, with breast milk. I mean, you may have some, a little bit, uh, if you're pumping, um, you may have some plastic bags and those kinds of things, but um, nothing like it would be if you were um, formula feeding all the time. Um, it's also easy on the budget. Um, I have a lot of moms who say, well, I'm on WIC, so, you know, WIC is going to cover that. Not necessarily. It's going to, it's going to cover part of it, okay? You're still going to have to buy formula, even if you're on WIC. And formula is not cheap. Um, it's expensive, especially if you've got a baby who has to be on a special formula. Um, some of the, um, formulas for babies with very sensitive tummies or for babies who um, are lactose intolerant are very expensive. They're very pricey. So um, it is much easier on the budget. And a lot of moms who um, have those babies with those tummy issues don't realize it until they wean their baby. And um, after they wean their baby, they're like, oh, what have I done? Because now my baby is fussy. Um, he's gassy. She's um, cries all the time uh, because she's uncomfortable. So, um, and they wish they could go back 
and that's not you can relactate but it's not easy and it's not always possible so just think about those things uh let's talk there's i think the next slide yeah this is a great slide look at the ingredients that are lacking in your formula you're not you don't have those antibodies you don't have those hormones those antiviral substances uh, you don't have those allergy fighting substances you're missing the um, growth factors and the enzymes that breast milk contains um, so there's just so much that your breast milk doesn't have that your formula doesn't have that breast milk contains and again I go back to that living cells um, and the healing properties that breast milk has um, just as an example of the healing properties I'll tell you a quick story um, and I don't remember who told me this um, I wish I could go back and talk to them again but uh, there was a gentleman who had cancer his um, gut had just been devastated by the chemo and the radiation and he was literally dying in front of his wife because um, of the devastation that the uh, radiation and chemo had done on his intestines and someone suggested that they she put some breast milk into his feeding tube and it healed him I mean it the the breast milk had such amazing healing qualities that it healed his gut and so that's just one example of the tremendous value that that breast milk has so I just encourage you to um, to remember that uh, that story always um, amazed me it's just a really good example of how powerful um, breast milk is. Let's talk a little bit about how to breastfeed. Um, just briefly, we don't have a lot of times to, to go into a lot of depth. Um, again, I would encourage you to um, utilize the resources in our community. Uh, all of our hospitals um, offer breastfeeding classes. Um, if you're on WIC, um, some of them also have scholarships available um, for WIC moms. So be sure you ask for that. Um, they're not always available. I think they have a limited number of them, but it's very possible that you could have uh, a class with uh, a scholarship. And again, with COVID, they may be doing those by Zoom. I don't know how that's, I have not. Um, heard how they're doing that but I'm sure they're doing accommodating um, moms in some way at this point um, I think one of the most important things is to ask for help um, your nurses in labor and delivery your nurses in the nursery postpartum as well as your lactation consultants are there to help you um, again to reach out to those in your um, in your circle uh, family members, friends, um, who can you call when you get home and you're exasperated and you don't know what to do next? Who's going to be able to provide you with that um, encouragement and give you some suggestions? Again, that's another place that Facebook page comes into play. Um, I love getting on there and um, reading the suggestions that um, other mothers give to a mom who's struggling. The support that's there and the positive energy is amazing. Um, one of the first things that you need to think about is being comfortable. Um, find a good chair that's just, you know, it's cozy that you can prop up in. Um, you wanna make sure you've got pillows supporting your arms. Um, the last thing you want is for your arm to get tired. Um, you want to maybe use um, there are pillows that are actually created to help you with nursing um, but you don't have to have that you can use regular pillows and just find a way for you to be comfortable um, make sure baby is good and awake um, 
you may have to change diapers. You may have to um, strip them down. Um, you may have to do uh, some stimulation to get them awake, but that's really, really important. Um, establishing a good latch, again, is very important. Um, and that is something that hopefully you have established before you leave the hospital while you've still got that great support system in, in place. Um, making sure that you know what that good latch looks like, um, that that baby's mouth is gaped well when you um, bring the baby to the breast and that, um, that his head, his or her head is kind of tilted back a little bit so that he can get on that breast appropriately. The cradle hold, um, you're holding your baby with um, his or her head on your forearm and then um, you want to always make sure that the baby is facing you. You don't want that baby lying sideways and then having to turn his head to get to your nipple. Um, it's difficult to swallow that way, try it. Um, you can't swallow very well with your head turned to the side. Um, that's usually uh, the position that uh, a lot of ladies choose. Um, the cross cradle hold, you're gonna hold your baby along the area opposite the breast you're using and support your head, baby's head at the base of the head. You don't wanna put your head your hand up behind the baby's head. You want it on that neck and just giving that neck and head just a little bit of support because you want that baby's head to be able to drop back. Um, the football hold um, is very uh, comfortable. Most women who've had a, a C-section find that a little bit more comfortable or if you have large breast, um, moms find that that's a little bit better hold for them. The other one that I wanted to just kind of briefly talk about is called the laid back hold. Um, it's a more relaxed baby led approach. Um, and I encourage you to try this in labor and delivery when your baby is first brought to you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about skin to skin in a minute, but when that baby is first brought to you, um, it may or may not have a diaper on. Um, and you're usually you know, you've got on that hospital gown. So take that baby and lay it skin to skin. Let it lay long ways. Head is gonna be just below your breast and baby's body is gonna be parallel to yours. Um, your baby instinctively will go to your breast. It, it's pretty amazing. Um, they've really done some amazing studies with this, but your baby searches for your breast and actually will go and latch itself on if you give it enough time. In the United States, we're too impatient. <laughs> so we don't see that happen very much, but in other countries, um, they do this routinely. And so um, it's an amazing, Google it and go to YouTube and watch some of those videos. It's pretty cool. Um, the way that our, again, the way that our babies are created is amazing the instincts that they have, the, just the natural instincts to go to that breast. So we talked a little bit about how important that was as far as skin to skin. So now I'm gonna turn it over to, oh, excuse me, we're gonna do some questions and answers. Um, is there anybody who has any questions they wanna ask before we go? Jeannie, I, did, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. However, if there are questions and answers that you have, uh, questions that you'd like for Jeannie to answer, you can go ahead and type them in really quickly before we move on to our next presenter. Any questions and answers, questions that you'd like answered? Good deal. This will make it on to Christine. Jenny, I see a Jenny, I see a question that says, what is the best way to breastfeed if you have inverted nipples? Are we paused? Uh no. Says what the question says, it's what is the best way to breastfeed oh, with inverted nipples? Oh, okay. 
I'm not sure if we lost Jeannie there. Maybe her video, Jenny, maybe her video froze up. But we'll hopefully come back. Let's see, what is this question? How do I know if my baby is getting enough? Can you speak about medicine? No mothers are sick. I'm thinking that maybe Jeannie's video might have dropped. And so we'll come back to those questions and answers. Um, we'll go on to the next presenter. Christy, if you uh, don't mind coming on in. Not a problem. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Christy Gay. And on behalf of Gift of Life, welcome. So glad you're here. And um, I'm thrilled to be here to be able to talk to you about Skin to Skin. Um, it's something that is really important to me um, as a mom. And then it really kind of goes back to my days clinically when I worked in labor and delivery, um, being able to help moms and dads um, perform skin to skin while in the hospital and then encouraging it on after they left. So, you know, what exactly is skin to skin? Um, I will say that it is something 14 years ago, I'll use my oldest child, um, I'd never heard of skin to skin. So with him, there was never skin to skin going on. Um, fast forward four years to my youngest, who's almost 10, skin to skin was being done. So we are learning new things about skin to skin, like breastfeeding. Um, we're learning benefits of it um, for mom, baby, for families. So just to dive in, what exactly is skin to skin? Um, skin to skin is the first and best kind of care that mothers and fathers can provide to their newborn. Um, this happens in the hospital setting, um, or it can happen at home too, um, because it doesn't have to just stop in the hospital. Um, baby can be snuggled on your chest, obviously mom skin to baby skin, immediately after birth in most uncomplicated deliveries. Um, again, we just want to have that mom and baby back together after delivery, so that bonding can really start, um, especially in that first hour after delivery. It's so important to have mom and baby together to facilitate that bonding process. I get questions all the time. Can preterm babies do skin to skin? Absolutely. Obviously, full-term babies with an uncomplicated delivery, we like to get babies skin to skin immediately. Um, with our preterm babies, um, as long as they're doing okay, um, or it might take a few days depending on what's going on with the baby, but um, it's still highly encouraged to have skin to skin for mom and baby. And then also um, skin to skin is one of the best ways to start the baby's life. If you think about it, mom has carried baby for hopefully 40 weeks or nine months and baby has been in this warm, caring environment where um, dark, but it's peaceful because she or he hears mom's voice, mom's heartbeat, and then all of a sudden goes to this process of birth, um, comes out, it's loud, it's bright, it's cold. And so baby's going, what is going on here? So babies come out crying because they're just confused what's going on. And you get that baby right on mom's skin and almost immediately baby's going to calm down and that bonding and that feeling of security is started immediately. All right, next slide. So what are some of the benefits? Like I said, over and over, it helps to promote that parent bonding and infant bonding. Again, we want that secure attachment. We want mom and baby to start this relationship of, hey, I trust you, I trust you, and we're gonna be a team together. Um, it also, as Jenny talked about, it helps to prepare this sweet baby for breastfeeding naturally. Um, like she said, having that laid back hold with baby, a lot of times baby will just naturally latch on to mom. Well, the reason that is, is when you have skin to skin, that stimulation in the baby's brain happens and that stimulation causes baby to naturally latch on. To me, that's such a complex idea, but yet 
a brand new baby can do it. So it's amazing. It also helps regulate baby's breathing, heart rate, and body temperature, along with blood sugar. And that's hard to think that medical interventions aren't doing it. But you don't always have to have that medical intervention. So again, having that skin to skin time really can promote that and help the baby out in the long term. Obviously, it helps with improved weight gain for baby, um, improves that brain development. We know that brain development occurs the most with that positive, secure attachment between mom and baby and then dad too. So again, it's that initial giving them that boost of the brain. And then also what Jenny had said, it helps to prolong that breastfeeding. We want mom and baby to breastfeed as long as they can. Next slide. And then obviously the benefits for parents. I know I sound like a broken record, but again, that bonding is crucial to have between mom and baby and then dad and baby. Um, it helps to control the baby's health. You know, things are outside of our, our hands a lot of time, but if you have that skin to skin with baby, it just takes it to another level um, as far as that security and then also the health benefits. It helps to overcome those feelings of separation. Again, thinking about when baby was inside mom's belly, um, baby is being touched and talked to all the time. Um, you get out in this world and it's just a different environment for baby. So having mom and baby close together really do facilitate that feeling of, um, hey, I got this, my mom is still here because mom and baby need that attachment. Um, it also helps to produce that breast milk. Again, that hormonal stimulation helps with the breast milk, and then it increases the likelihood of breastfeeding success. And I'm looking over um, our local hospitals providing skin-to-skin -skin in the operating room during C-sections. Um, to my knowledge, they are. Um, it's been a few years since I've been in the hospital, but um, from, my, from what I'm seeing and hearing, they are trying to. Um, so I would, if you are pregnant, I would reach out to your OBGYN and ask them if that's a practice that's common. If it's not immediate, sometimes babies are taken to the nursery and dried and weighed really fast. And so by the time the surgery is over, mom and baby are reunited in the recovery room and um, skin to skin can happen there. So that's a great question. In the perfect world, I would say yes. Um, it happens all the time, but um, currently I'm not 100% sure. So, thank you for this time. If y'all have questions, type them in. I'm going to try to look down here to see. If any questions that you have for Christy regarding skin to skin or something else you think uh, she might be able to answer, please go ahead and drop it in the Q&A box. Well, I do see uh, at what point do we recommend talking to the OBGYN that you want to do skin to skin. It's never too early. Um, if you do it at every visit, just say, hey, I want to do skin to skin. You know, hey, don't forget, I still want to do skin to skin. It's built into a lot of um, procedures within the hospital. But just as a reminder, let them put that in your chart. Um, um, that would really help, you know, with advocating to do it. And your nurse is on your side too, so hopefully that'll make it happen. Christy, there's another question that says, um, do OBGYNs have the right to tell me I cannot do skin to skin immediately after birth? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, you have rights as a mom. Um, I would just have that open conversation. They're typically not going to come in and say, okay, skin skin's over. We got to move on if baby is doing well and there are no emergencies going on with mom and baby. So if everything's going well and there's no medical issue going on, then you should be okay. Typically, they're not going to come in and, and say, all right, time to spread you out and move you on. Um, and there's one more skin to skin question that I can see. It says, um, if for some reason mom can't do skin to skin, there's a medical emergency of sorts. Uh, is, can the husband or the child's father, can, is that still beneficial? Absolutely. Dads can do it. Partners can do it. Um, again, it helps to facilitate the bonding. If you have a grandmother who wants to do skin to skin. If you have an older sibling who wants to do skin to skin, absolutely. Because again, 
having that skin on skin with baby, those benefits are still there. So if you decide that um, it's working for you, it's going well, keep doing it. I see a question, do you recommend doing it after leaving the hospital? Absolutely. Um, there's really not a cutoff time that you can do it. I actually saw a picture on social media, this was a couple weeks ago, and it was a teething baby and mom was doing skin to skin. She said, there's nothing else that'll work. I'm doing skin to skin and the baby looks so calm and so relaxed. So it was great. I wish I would have known that to share, you know, before to do skin to skin for, for teething babies too. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that helps. Looking and then I see something in the chat box. It says as a first time mom, would you recommend doing skin to skin immediately after delivery? or after the baby has been clean and seen by the doctor for whatever medical staff? Either way, I mean, if you wanna do skin to skin immediately, again, depending on everything else that's going on, there are a lot of moving parts at delivery, but again, baby comes out crying and everything is going well, shoot, do that skin to skin, put baby on. And you know, a lot of times, again, they will naturally start to breastfeed. So um, yeah, I would say do it right after. They're dirty, but it's worth it. <laughs> and then I see one more question that I'm actually not familiar with. It says, is there a cost for skin to skin? Is there a cost? Absolutely not. Skin to skin is free. It is mom and baby. Um, literally naked baby on mom's chest. So that is a free action that you could do. There's not gonna be a charge for that in the hospital. Looking to see well, Christy, thanks for answering those questions. I think we have them all uh, for that particular portion. We can go ahead and turn it over to Jesse. Jesse, you want to go ahead and chime in for us? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse Yates, and I'm the Fatherhood Coordinator uh, for the Gift of Life Foundation. It is with uh, great pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you some important, <clears throat> relevant, and necessary information regarding how dads can support breastfeeding moms. We always talk about, or oftentimes we talk about, a father's involvement with their children and how important it is for them to be engaged in every aspect of their lives. Um, we talk about outcomes. We talk about the benefits of their environments. However, in breastfeeding is one of those areas that get overlooked. We, we kind of exclude how important dads are to a mom that is breastfeeding. Uh, oftentimes when we think about breastfeeding, we're thinking about mom nursing and, and bonding. We, we're not necessarily thinking about uh, the role dad can play when it comes to breastfeeding. Uh, while that role is really limited or even non-existent. To me, this myth uh, of, of dads not playing a major role in breastfeeding couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, dads play a major role, a major, major role. Uh, in fact, one of the main things we need to understand about dads playing a, a role in breastfeeding that if dad is on board, mom is more likely to attempt breastfeed. She's more likely to do it if, if she has uh, dad support. Uh, that being said, I will be talking about how dads can support breastfeeding moms. Uh, we can put up the, uh, the poll. Just want to ask the question to you guys. What are some ways uh, you think fathers can support mothers while breastfeeding? You guys can answer that question for me.
give another minute or so to Okay, uh, ninety-seven percent. Learn more about breastfeeding. That's great. Educating yourself is always a good way um, to support mom, because the more you know, the more you're likely to do. Uh, Sixty-eight percent. Bring baby to mother for feeding. Absolutely. Stay with mom while baby's nursing. Great, great. So let's dive into how dads can support breastfeeding. Um, we're going to start with mom is breastfeeding to help her feel comfortable and relaxed. Uh, Jenny spoke a little bit about this uh, mom feeling comfortable. Mom feeling comfortable is, is, is very, is essential with attempting to breastfeed. All women are different. So, uh, and our pregnancies are different. So, what might make mom feel comfortable this time might not make her feel comfortable this time, the next time. It's up to dad to communicate these gestures to make sure mom is as comfortable as she can be. Uh, so it's important for dad to talk to mom, under, listen to what she's saying. The main priority, the main priority for dad is to make sure mom and baby stay happy and healthy. So make sure that you are uh, communicating with mom to make sure she's comfortable, okay? Um, help with child, child care and household chores. This can take a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure off mom. Uh, so she can get some rest or even do things she, she enjoy doing. Oftentimes mom will stop breastfeeding because she feel that time does not permit uh, her to do so. So as dad, taking these simple words off her to-do list can empower her to really uh, focus in on breastfeeding and continuing to breastfeed because she doesn't have that worry of I have to do this, I have to do that, uh, I'll take care of this, take care of that. Just take some of that pressure off of her and that really, really can encourage her to continue breastfeeding. Limit the number of visitors and visiting time. Uh, we know when the baby is born, everybody is going to want to see baby. However, pay attention to mom. Pay attention to her, what she's saying. Be mindful of her energy. Make sure you uh, think about her energy. Notice her energy. A lot of visitors at one time or all the time can be overwhelming for mom, especially when she's trying to breastfeed. There's nothing like someone showing up unexpected and you're tired and exhausted. So make sure you be mindful of her energy and make sure she's getting her rest. So limit the number of visitors. Um, the good thing, well, I don't know if I want to say good thing, but the thing about the pandemic now is that they're not allowing all the visitors in the uh, in the room. So this is a this is really allowing mom and dad to uh, kind of depend on one another, lean on each other for support, which is a good thing. Uh, because all the visitors can be overwhelming. So uh, really, dad is all mom has for support in that regard during this time, during this pandemic. Uh, even though you want to limit the, um, the number of visitors, do not hesitate to ask for help. I, I think uh, Jenny and Krista touched on asking for help is important. Um, so don't hesitate to do that. Call for reinforcement. Uh, we know work and time, it takes a toll on everybody. All the time, dad will not be able to be there. Uh, th dad is not available. But this is the time you can turn to family who has offered to help. But with doing this time, it's important to understand that there is a pandemic. So when you are uh, asking for help or someone has someone you trust have offered you help, make sure that they are quarantined for at least 10 days before 
they uh, become available to, to baby. Because at the end of the day, it's about safety at this point. Safety, safety, safety. I can't really express that enough. So make sure that who, whomever is um, offering up the help, make sure that they are quarantined for at least 10 days, okay? Um, make time for your baby. This is a, an important uh, thing to do, a way that dads can support mom barefoot and make bonding time for yourself. Uh, it is important, it is very important that you have your own quality time to bond. We just talked about skin to skin and how it is good for dad to also do skin to, to skin. So take time for yourself as dad to make sure you're having that bonding time. Give, give mom time to not only rest, we seen that on the video, uh, what the what the client was saying that her husband would do things so she can sleep in or get rest. Give mom time to rest. I even do things she she enjoy doing. Uh, the baby needs quality time with both. The baby need quality time with mom. The baby need quality time with you. Uh, it, even if it's giving mom time to do things she enjoy doing, it doesn't always have to be rest. So make sure you're making quality time as dad. For your baby, quality time and budding time for your baby. Go to the next slide. Uh, we heard this at night, bring baby to mom for feeding and stay with them for feeding so all three can bond. We just talked about the importance of bonding, bonding, bonding uh, when it comes to breastfeeding. So just because mom is feeding, doesn't mean dad needs to exit the room. This is a great opportunity to uh, for for you guys to bond as a family. Believe it or not, this can empower mom. This can make her feel supported. This can make her feel like you guys are really bonding as a family. So when you bring baby to mom, make sure uh, sometimes, you don't have to do it every time, but make sure you stay there to encourage mom to keep going as well as bonding because you do want to encourage her. You want to encourage her to keep going and to keep pushing because sometimes it can get difficult. Sometimes it can be tiring. Sometimes, you know, she feel like it's a lot, but your support and being available and present in that moment can really make her feel empowered and encourage her to keep pushing to breastfeed because it's worth it. It's worth it at the, at the end of the day. Uh, Jenny talked about all the benefits earlier, so you know it's worth it. You know, um, even though it could be tired, it's about the baby well-being. So, uh, just encourage her to keep going. If you see um, baby searching for mom's breast, sucking his fist, his or her fist, or making sucking noises, mm -hmm. take him or her for feeding. Um, mom, at the end of the day, mom, she she's doing enough. Uh, by doing this, it can make mom feel supported and not alone. Uh, she needs that help. Mom really needs that help. So if you if you hear or if you see baby sucking or, or wanting to be uh, fed, make sure you, you make that small gesture to get up and get the baby uh, and bring him or her to mom because she, that can take a lot off too because um, we want her to feel supported at the end of the day. Supporting mom is the best way uh, to encourage her to keep going. And my favorite is um, learn, 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 learn. Educate yourselves about breastfeeding. You, you got to educate yourself. Um, do your research. Talk to professionals. Ask questions. Get as much information as possible to educate yourself on breastfeeding, okay? Um, we hear people say things all the time. We, we, we see the charts. We see, we hear what people say. We even see family members that's, that's breastfeeding or we've seen uh, peers that, that have, they've attempted to breastfeed, but it's nothing like knowing for yourself the benefits and what, uh, how important it is to, to breastfeed. So always look at educate yourself and learning more, learning more about breastfeeding. Um, the more you know as a father, the more supportive you can be because you know uh, for yourself, you're not just listening to what somebody else say or even what she's saying about the benefits of breastfeeding and why she wants to breastfeed, you actually know for yourself. So it's nothing uh, more important than educating yourself 
about uh, the the good of breastfeeding. So educate yourselves. Get learn as much as you can. You can never talk to too many people about uh, the benefits of breastfeeding and, and things like that. Um, if mom has trouble breastfeeding, help her talk to weak breastfeeding experts, healthcare providers, or lactation consultants. Uh, there's a lot of people available to talk to and get information from rather than uh, giving up. The easy thing to do is to quit. It, it can be difficult. It can be frustrating. It can, it can be all those things. However, um, encourage her not to quit. It's worth it. It's worth it. Um, it's worth it to your baby and your baby deserves it. Um, so just encourage her to talk to people. You talk to people to educate yourself. Uh, as I stated previously, uh, is nothing better than educating yourself and knowing for yourself the, the benefits of breastfeeding and what to do, what to expect, uh, and all those things. So you can really encourage her to keep going. And praise mom for breastfeeding. Do something special for her. Um, everyone likes to be told that they're doing something good, especially when it's by the person that you care about. So uh, it's really important not only to be there, be available and supportive of her and, and do all the things I, I mentioned before, but it's also to, uh, good to let her hear that she's doing a good job. It's also good to uh, push her to continue going and encourage her and let her know that it is worth it. So uh, praise mom for breastfeeding and do something special for her. Go to the next one. This here is great. Uh, how dads can support breastfeeding, uh, the kind of support women need. This is a guy who's uh, who's actually has tricked the baby mind to the baby wanted to breast, so he tricked the baby. The mom was not available, so he tricked the mind to put the bottle of breast milk in his shirt and and nurse the baby as if he was breastfeeding. So th this is the type of support. Get creative. Get creative. Do whatever it takes to make sure that the baby is being nursed. Uh, so I love this picture. This, this small picture says a lot to what can be done. Um, we can give so much support as men and, and, and as fathers, we can support um, our moms that's attempting to, to breastfeed. It is well worth it. I'm here for questions. Jesse, you have a lot of questions to answer. I'm going to give you, yes, you do. I'm going to give you this first one that I'm looking at. It says, how should a father educate himself on breastfeeding? Um, you, you can talk to consultants. You can go to groups. Um, I, I think a lot, even the breastfeeding groups that the moms go to, I think some of them even allow dads to attend if they want more information um, and, and read. Um, you can always pull up things online. It's a lot of articles on breastfeeding. So um, any support group you can be a, be a part of, you should do. And um, just try to learn as much as you can. And to that, I'm gonna roll into the next question. It says, are there uh, local breastfeeding support groups that are just for dads? Um, well, I use the, really any support group because the, the support groups are made for the men. Like my uh, support group is made for the guys um, and any question can be asked. We use the 24-7 dad curriculum and any question can be asked, including about breastfeeding, how, they, uh, how dads can support that. So um, yes, uh, especially Gift of Life Foundation, Fathers in Action support group. Uh, we do talk about how dads can support mom, not only doing breastfeeding, but in every uh, area. Good stuff. So this question is kind of like a two in one. How, what are some ways that dad can praise mom for breastfeeding? You talked about that as one of your bullet points. And also, what are some ways that mom can show her appreciation to dad for his support of breastfeeding? Uh, one, words go a, a long way. Uh, sometimes mom just needs to hear uh, from dad that uh, 
you know, I'm proud of what you're doing for our, for our child. So a lot of times words can go a long way. Um, even a card, you know, saying that you, you really appreciate her because at the end of the day, it's her decision at the end of the day. So you do want to praise her for uh, making that attempt and knowing that the baby is worth that. And, and um, because like I said, it is her decision. So uh, words of encouragement, cards, just anything you have to be creative. Uh, anything you can do to that you know she likes, I think that would be beneficial. And what was the second part? The second part of that is how can a mom show appreciation to the dad for supporting her journey with breastfeeding? Uh, it's kind of it kind of goes both ways. Uh, sometimes dads need to hear as well. You know, I appreciate your support because sometimes men can feel like no matter what they're doing, they're not being as supportive as they need to be. So to hear that, you know, I appreciate you uh, supporting me. That can go a long way with with guys as well. And so still along the veins of support uh, with dads, it says, how can I get my child's father on board with breastfeeding since we don't live together? Because we know that's, that's the reality for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, they might not have uh, be cohabitating, if you will, or be in a two-parent household for some baby. So how can that father support that mom to breastfeed that child? Uh, if, if, if they don't live together, I know pumping is, is the option. Uh, and just let him know why you want to breastfeed. Um, and like I said, it's good not only for you to educate yourself, but to help educate him and give him information about how you want to, um, why you want to breastfeed and you're going to want to breastfeed and the pumping, cause it can be stored. So um, I, I think it's a good idea to not only store some where you're at, but also to store where he, where he's living. So, you know, it can't be a conflict of, you know, I don't have any here or, or you're not available. So uh, just working together and, and educating him on the importance of breastfeeding. Okay. Right. Kind of a loaded question. It says, what if my husband is a smoker and he uses that as an excuse to not support uh, breastfeeding because he doesn't want to expose the baby to secondhand smoke? How can I get him to understand that I still need his support? Uh yeah, that's um well we know that the 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 smoking does not need to be around the baby. Um even the smell, at least um, you know, you can't tell anybody what to do, but we know the the health risk of, of smoking, but um at least during nursing time, you know, that time need to be really set aside for nursing. Um I don't know if, if you're using a schedule or anything, but just because he smoked doesn't mean that he can't support you breastfeeding. You know, that, that really has nothing to do with the support that he can give to breastfeeding because he'll have to also support with formula even though he smoked. Uh, so it, it's kind of, he just needs to support and educate himself on the benefits of it. And I guess that kind of leads into the next question that we have for you. It says, Jesse, how would you recommend to someone to let the father know that it's important uh, for him to support the mom when breastfeeding? I guess, how would you kind of convince them or persuade them that this is something that's important and something that she, they should be educated on? Um, really, a lot of guys does not support the breastfeed. It, it's a lot of a lot of reasons that tie into why dads don't support it. The number one reason I think is because lack of lack of education or, or knowing the importance of it. The next reason a lot of a lot of our moms, well, th this goes for, for, for everybody, uh, men and women, we oftentimes hear what well, I didn't breastfeed you and you're fine. Uh, and we know times now are different. And you just need to express your um your want to about you want to breastfeed and really be uh, focused in on that's what you're going to do. Because like I said earlier, at the end of the day, it is your decision to breastfeed. So if you, if you're stuck on making that decision to breastfeed, um, help him educate himself on breastfeeding, bring him information, uh, tell him, tell him about support groups and tell him how important it is to you 
uh, let him know how important it is to you. Because if it, if he feel like he's getting the vibe that it's not a big deal to you, it's not going to be a big deal to him. So just let him know how important it is to you. Direct questions that I have for you, Jesse. Um, if Christy could turn her camera back on and her mic, as well as Jenny, if Jenny made it back on, if you two could turn back on your cameras and your mics, there's a few questions that we want you to answer. Christy, I'm going to give this question to you. It says, Would you say that practice into scan will cause the crawl method? I guess the breast crawl that we kind of saw um, in an image earlier. Yeah, so looking into it, I think there are a couple ways to think about it. I think the baby, baby will naturally progress to the breast um, because they do have that sensory um, component to be able to find the breast because they can taste, they can smell, um, they can also see, um, even at delivery. They can't see far, but they can still see. So um, the other thing is, is that they have that stepping reflex. So if baby is doing the um, skin to skin and baby's legs are drawn in and you put your arm under baby's legs, baby will naturally step forward. If you can imagine that, it's hard to explain on a video, but so their reflex, the reflex, the stepping reflex will help project them up toward the breast, but they will naturally try to get closer to the breast for food. So that helps. Yes. The next one for them to you, Jenny, welcome back. <laughs> um, the, the infamous question, how do I know if my baby is getting enough milk? I think that's every mother's thought when they're breastfeeding because we can't see through our breasts. So how do we know? Really and truly, their best way to know is if baby's satisfied. Um, and also if baby's having wet diapers. It's also important to remember that initially um, during those first few days, baby may only have uh, two or three wet diapers. Um, I think the rule of thumb is one the first day, two the second day, three the third. Um, their little tummies are so small that they're not, that colostrum, there's not a lot of uh, quantity to it. It's the quality that's there. The um, tummy is only that first few days is only about the size of the end of your thumb. If you can imagine like a large marble. So it's because it's not taking in that much, it's not going to be putting out that much. So as the baby starts to get more um, volume, starts to take in more volume, then of course it stands to reason that the output is going to increase. But the biggest thing is, is baby satisfied. And to that question, uh, dovetail into another one that says how much milk should I actually be pumping for those moms who do pump because they're away for whatever reason or those who may be exclusive pumpers how much should you actually be producing or pumping that's a hard question because um, you don't necessarily pump the same amount as baby would be taken in um, and it, a lot of it depends on the type of pump you're using if you're using an inexpensive uh, battery powered pump or one that uh, is not doesn't have a very strong suction to it then um, your output is not going to be that great um, so I, that's the reason we really recommend too that moms start out nursing and getting that milk uh, established before they start pumping um so that that volume is there um it's just very difficult to do especially if you do not have a good pump um if you've got a good hospital grade pump or a a good pump that like one of the insurance companies provide you with then you're going to have a better um experience as far as volume goes but um a lot of moms will try to pump to see how much the baby's getting. It's not always the same. It, it's not necessarily equivalent. 
Thank you. For that. Um, this question I'm going to give to Christy. It says, is there a wrong way to do skin to skin? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, well, I would say the wrong way would be having baby dressed and mom dressed. The idea is to have that skin on skin contact. So if you have one of the two is wearing some type of clothing, then I would say that would probably be the wrong way to do it. Um, so really the idea is to get direct skin to skin contact. Um, obviously mom or dad needs to be awake during skin to skin, um, just for safe sleeping purposes. Um, you know, mom or dad needs to be awake. Um, baby obviously is probably going to go to sleep because baby's feeling good and, and secure. So obviously awake and then again, that direct skin to skin. All right, this uh, next question is kind of a compound of two questions it's about medication when it comes to breastfeeding. Um, can you speak to that, whether it's, you know, medication for chronic conditions or, hey, I just suddenly got the flu or something like that? How does that affect uh, the breast milk? Can you still take medication um, when you're dealing with those type of things? There are very few medications that you cannot nurse with. Um, the biggest um, suggestion I would give you is to talk to your pediatrician or talk to your physician. Um, if it's blood pressure medication and it is not, um, say it's, it's something that's not recommended that you breastfeed, then, you know, talk to your doctor and see if there's another medication that you could use um, that would give you the same effect, but that would be safe with breastfeeding. Um, there's also some websites that you can go to, to um, see what the um, recommendations are for certain meds. Um, Cher might could speak more to that uh, than I can, um, but it's always a good idea to talk to your pediatrician as well as your OB. Um, they can give you guidance. Your, drug, your pharmacist can also give you guidance with that. Uh, this one is um, still along the same lines. It just popped up. Um, how does cannabis affect breast milk? We know that CBD is kind of becoming a, a big thing um, with certain things being legalized here, there, and everywhere. It says, how does cannabis affect breast milk? Uh, it is not recommended to uh, use cannabis during breast uh, during breastfeeding. Um, I honestly, I'm not sure about that, Cher. Are you comfortable with that question? I'm just not uh, familiar. I know it's not recommended, but as far as the effect, I'm not sure. And we got um, some questions about work or returning to work and daycare. Um, and I'm sure any one of you can answer this. The first question is, how can I get my daycare on board? giving my baby breast milk and the second question is along those same lines it says my job won't give me much time to pump what am I supposed to do if I want to continue to breastfeed as far as the daycare um you're I, I don't know of any I've not had any experience with daycares um not being on board uh they should be willing to work with you as far as whatever your choices are, as far as uh, nursing. I do know that the um, extension service is working with uh, some of the daycares as far as getting them um, educated as to the benefits and how to uh, do paste feedings with babies. Uh, to help with that. Maybe Adela or Cher could jump in and, and help us with that one. Um, along with what you said with the Alabama Cooperative Extension, uh, they are providing that breastfeeding friendly certification for those centers that um, are interested in that and it's something free if there are any daycare providers that are on here. Uh, the training is free, but to any moms that are looking for centers that are already breastfeeding friendly, you can go to the Cooperative Extension website and it'll give you a list of those. And the question about work, and I, anybody can answer that. It says, my job won't give me much time to pump. What am I supposed to do if I want to continue to breastfeed after returning to work? 
My suggestion would be to discuss with your manager uh, the federal laws, um, giving you the right to pump, um, discuss with them the benefits as far as, um, you know, if I'm able to continue breastfeeding my baby and providing my baby with breast milk, then that's going to mean that I'm off less time because my baby shouldn't be as sick as it might be if, um, if I didn't provide my baby with breast milk. What do you think, Adela? I say uh, go in with a plan. I know for myself that's what I had to do. Um, you know, if work is going to be an issue, I know where I work is kind of like, uh, you don't really have any breaks and times and stuff for all of that. So it's like if you, <laughs> I was once told, if you present a problem with a problem, it's going to be a problem. So just kind of come in with a solution in mind already and say, am I able to kind of like you, like it was uh, stated in the webinar earlier, I think we have this space available. Can I use this during these times and that kind of thing to sort of kind of alleviate that. And it should be, you should be able to uh, be accommodated. And like you said, for those that are hourly employees, there is a uh, federal and state laws that protect you in place. Um, another question, and I'm sure Christy or Jenny can answer this. It says, if you have inverted nipples, is there a best way to breastfeed? I think that um, that's where your lactation con consultant is going to come in at your um, while you're in the hospital. You're going to need help with that initial um, breastfeeding experience right there in the hospital. A lot of times, um, a nipple shield will help with that. Um, learning how to use that nipple shield appropriately um, will help. Um, but I definitely would um, talk to your lactation consultant in the hospital about your concerns about that. And the last question that we have um, says, is any food for mother need to avoid for babies to have more gases? So I'm guessing, is, are there any foods that a mom would need to avoid to eliminate having a gassy baby? I think that's trial and error. Um, we used to think that garlic and onion and you know, spicy foods pose problems. I think that um, in recent years, we've found that not necessarily to be true for all mothers. Um, I usually suggest that they eat as they normally would. And if baby gets fussy, then try eliminating some foods. But uh, I think typically you don't see a whole lot of um, problems there that are really food related to mom. I have seen some lactose intolerant babies who mom had to eliminate all the lactose related foods out of her diet uh, if baby was having a lot of issues. But, um, but as far as like gassy providing, producing foods, I, I don't see it that much. What about you, Adela? Um, I'll let Cher speak to that. I know just with certain things, you can kind of see how a baby reacts. Um, I know for me, having to remove a lot of lactose from my diet uh, helps with my baby's skin. Um, my smallest baby right now um, helps, you know, keep the eczema away. But I'll let Cher answer that. I don't see any other lingering questions, but the things that we did not get to, I'm going to let Cher come in with, since we don't have any more. Cher, can you go ahead and come on, cut on your mic and cut on your camera? There she is. Cher, can you answer those questions about the foods um, that maybe mom should avoid in terms of how it may affect the baby's, how it may affect the breast milk? And also, are you able to answer the question about how does cannabis affect? Yes. Affect yes. Um, yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Cher. Um, I want to thank the speakers before anything else today. Um, a special thank you to Jesse. There's lots of us women out here helping women breastfeed, but not a lot of men. And I would not be here today had it not been for the support my husband gave me many years ago. Um, that was before the internet. It was before lactation consultants. Um, and I had a lot of negativity around me. If it hadn't been for my husband saying, hang in there, 
uh, the human race wouldn't have made it without breastfeeding. I don't think he did any of the other things on your list, Jesse. I looked, but he supported me. And that's why I do what I do, because he got me through the, the early days. Um, okay, so diet. In general, we tell women they don't need to change anything about their diet to breastfeed. Um, it is an individual basis. Some babies, in fact, even working with moms from baby to baby, there definitely there could be one baby that's having trouble with foods in her diet, and the next baby does not have that. It's so unique from baby to baby. And this is a situation where it's a trial and error. You may have to go on a diet where you take out all dairy. You may be taking out a lot of different things and then putting them back in one by one to see how the baby reacts. This is certainly something where reaching out to a lactation consultant can help you or a dietitian. Um, I've actually referred moms to dietitians before with unique uh, dietary concerns. So um, I hope that that helps. Um, marijuana. I have been doing this now for close to 40 years. So, um, of course, uh, things have really changed in terms of marijuana in our culture. Um, but one thing remains the same. Every, everybody agrees that this is not a good thing for mothers to do, but obviously there are mothers that are going to do that. Um, what I want you to remember is that what it does is it affects the mother's mothering ability. A mother who is under the influence of any drug is not going to be as attentive to her baby. And that is a really big concern. So I think in addition to all the other things out there, and there's still a lot of unknowns, there is not consistent information. Some of the experts disagree on um, how this should be, um, but it is, so important to remember that it can affect your mothering, your ability to remember your uh, relationship to time that you might not realize how much time has passed. So um, looking at all of that, I think is really important for moms. Um, I made some notes. I want to um, go back to skin to skin, Christy. One of the things that I used to get asked a lot when I was in a hospital setting by nurses that were panicked when they had a breastfeeding problem that they couldn't answer, I'd always tell them, if nothing else is working, put the baby in skin to skin and stay that way. It is a wonderful way to start out breastfeeding. It is a wonderful way to continue breastfeeding. It can solve a lot of problems. We know if a baby is not eating, is not breastfeeding well, not taking any nourishment, being in skin to skin can help stabilize their blood sugar levels and allow that baby time to get to that point where they're feeling hunger. And being in skin to skin will, will actually trigger the hunger. May not be there right 24 hours, taking in no food. This was one of the nurses' grandbabies in our hospital, but that mother kept that baby in skin to skin. And at about 24 hours, the baby finally ate but all was well, there were no, no problems. So skin to skin is an amazing thing to do, simple as can be. Um, and I've had doctors, several people ask questions about what doctors would allow. Um, doctors like skin to skin, it makes their job easier because they know that baby's gonna be healthier, quieter, more comfortable when they're in skin to skin with the moms and they want that for the babies. So, um, I don't think, again, unless there is a uh, health concern going on with that baby, any reason why you cannot do that. I had a friend, had a baby two weeks ago um, by cesarean, and she texted me right after baby was born with a picture. They were doing skin to skin um, very quickly. So doctors will work with you. Uh, let's see, what was the other thing? 
in the slide, in the little video that you showed, Jenny, about um, the mom talking about the baby with colic, this is how I kind of stepped into all of this with breastfeeding. I had a very, very colicky baby. Again, that's one of those things. There's still not a lot of wonderful information out there. We don't know all the answers, but it's believed that colic for most babies is reflux. So getting help for the reflux, which we've learned a lot about, is um, something your uh, client had said, Jenny, it led to the uh, uh, having a colicky baby for myself. I don't know any other way that I could have kept her happy, kept her um, quiet because she was screaming if I hadn't been breastfeeding. You can only stick a, a baby bottle in their mouth so much but the breast comforts babies beautifully when they're in pain or hungry. Um, question about inverted and flat nipples. I saw a couple of those in the chat box. And yes, what Jenny said was right. You wanna get help in the hospital. Many mothers before ever putting the baby to the breast would bring this up to me. I've got really flat nipples. So let me tell you what I told them. Babies don't latch on to nipples. We don't call it nipple feeding, we call it breastfeeding. Um, they, as, as Jenny showed you in her presentation with the, the latch, babies have to open wide and latch onto the breast tissue behind that nipple. So even if the nipple was perfectly flat, and I have seen some where I literally wasn't sure there was any nipple at all, in fact, um, inverted, severe in, in severely inverted, it doesn't matter. The baby just has to latch onto that skin behind it so that if the baby is healthy, awake, alert, and hungry, they can latch onto the wall. They do not always have trouble with inverted nipples. I'm not saying that that won't happen. Some mothers do. And the nipple shield is something we use to help a baby uh, to learn. Inverted nipples many times will evert as the baby continues to breastfeed, sometimes not. But I don't generally think of inverted nipples as a true problem for most mothers. So don't worry about it. If your baby hasn't been born yet, um, just see how things go, get help in the hospital, and think you'll be good. Um, was there anything else? Yes. There's a question that just came up, um, and I'm sure any one of you can answer this. It says, is COVID-19 creating any barriers for skin to skin? For skin to um, skin? Yeah. You want to answer to that, or do you mean to answer? No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, my understanding, and, and keep in mind, I'm not in the hospital right now working, but my understanding is that if there are no signs or symptoms of COVID-19, between mom or with mom, um, that they'll still allow it. Um, and I could be very wrong on that end, but that's my understanding at this point. Now, if you are COVID-19 positive, um, that could change a little. Um, but I, again, I'm not 100% sure. Just know that if you're not able to do it initially, there's still time. You can still do it even when the baby gets older. So when you get home or um, if the COVID 19 is a negative, you have negative test. So keep, you know, the, it's, it's not the end of the world if you can't get it in that first hour or during the hospital, it can still be done. That's such a good point you brought up. Um, I think a lot of people just think of this kind of like the skin to skin, like an event. It's something that should be ongoing, continuous. Anytime a mom has a breastfeeding problem, no matter how old that baby is, I have always included skin to skin as a solution to the problem because skin to skin can do so much. It is a powerful thing and a wonderful thing. We all enjoy that, including the baby. Um, and it helps to bring all those instincts back. So if babies had lots of bottles or separation from mama, it, it can be that reinitiation for, for her. 
would just uh, throw in there with the COVID um, topic, everything is changing from day to day. Mm -hmm. We don't know. There's just so many unknowns. Uh, one day we are um, using masks, the next day we're not, just as an example, okay? It's the same with COVID mamas and babies. So I would suggest that you talk to your OB doctor prior to delivery. Um, if I test positive, what is the policy? What what is going to happen with my baby? Is my baby going to be able to stay with me? Is my baby going to be um, quarantined away from me? Those are things that you need to address with your provider. Um, it, it is something that changes daily. Uh, everything that we know about COVID changes rapidly. So um, I, I just would encourage you to discuss your concerns um, with your OB provider ahead of time. I think that's the information that we have. Cher, I'm going to let you take it from here and go ahead and close us out. Okay. Well, thank you, Adila, for moderating. Thank all of you for attending today. I want to remind you, next month, August, is World Breastfeeding Month, and we will be having another free webinar for you. So watch out as we finalize the details about that. We will get it out there on the internet just as soon as possible. Um, at the end of this webinar, we will be sending to your email an evaluation. It helps us so much to have that evaluation filled out. So please take just, a, it's, it's just short and shouldn't take much time, but it will help us to continue to give you good webinars. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks to all of you, and we hope to see you next month. Bye.